Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing and connecting the community to cultural events, artists, and classes at columbusarts.com. And by the Ohio Arts Council. This time on Broad and High, a local sculptor enjoys the challenge that comes with creating works of public art. For public art, I think uh, you have to consider where it is, why people want it there, and how it's going to interact with the community. And we give you a behind the scenes look into the making of our award winning Columbus Neighborhood series. This and more right now on Broad and High. Hi, I'm Audrey Hassan, your host for Broad and High, the ultimate intersection of arts and culture, where we explore the character and creativity not only in Columbus, but across the country. Columbus artist John Tsunami is no stranger to public art. His latest installation is a sculpture at the New Maloney Health Center on the city's south side. We met with Tsunami to discuss his interest in many forms of art and also the opportunities and obligations that come with a commission to create art for a public space. When the Southside Settlement House was raised in 2012, the community not only lost a 112-year-old institution, but an iconic piece of art. Back in the early 80s, when this building was on the drawing boards, a local artist was asked to create something that would reflect the neighborhood's steel mills and glass factories. And being young and not knowing better, I said yes. Uh, the building had been originally uh, conceived as having a ceremonial staircase and it was a place that uh, was sort of the heart of the uh, settlement house. Tsunami has received many commissions for public art. On Livingston Avenue his sculpture commemorates the city's streetcars. At the Worthington Community Center a sculpture celebrates the human spirit. His planters grace all four corners of the State House in Columbus. Tsunami's work is accessible, sometimes tells a story, and, like the staircase, is often functional. You would have young kids on it. Uh, you have older people who could just sit there, and it was the scene for uh, weddings and such. Many of the programs at the Southside Settlement House will continue in a new community center in the renovated Reeb Elementary School. But the fate of the staircase remains in limbo. Fortunately, uh, when the settlement was being torn down, uh, it was uh, saved by the city and is in storage until they can figure out someplace else to put it. Now Tsunami's work can once again be seen on the south side. He was commissioned to create a sculpture for the new Maloney Health Center on Parsons. I wanted to have something uh, that was bright, friendly, and then uh, something that would reflect the history of the south side. So the back panel has uh, scenes of the south side, and uh, then you have the, the people who uh, uh, would be there with the glass and steel. Many artists are driven to create something that is entirely their own, an expression of their own vision or imagination. But it's different with many of Tsunami's projects. For public art, I think, uh, you have to consider um, its function, where it is, why people want it there, and how it's going to interact with the community. Tsunami's made a living as a designer creating signs, graphics, and installations. As an artist, his canvas is especially broad. I do photography, I do prints, I do painting, I do sculpture, I do ceramics, I started as a jeweler. Uh, part of it, I think I like the variety of uh, technology and craftsmanship. But the new technology will come and always be seen as a threat for some, but then others will embrace it. John Tsunami grew up in New York City. His father was one of the first photographers to document modern dance. 
and he was the staff photographer at the Museum of Modern Art. So John Tsunami grew up in an environment where art was important and essential. I've always believed that uh, part of being an artist involves uh, a responsibility to craft and that uh, you have to uh, make something that is, is pleasing and works uh, the way it should. Columbus has been Tsunami's home for more than 40 years. His involvement at settlement houses goes beyond his artwork. He's served on their boards because he appreciates how they build community in his adopted home. Well, Columbus is a wonderful place uh, because it is very accepting and uh, it, it encourages diversity. And at this time, I think Columbus is really on the cusp of becoming a very vibrant art city. Uh, there are always things happening. Uh, there's the downtown, which is becoming more and more a place to be, and more galleries, uh, more exhibitions. Are you familiar with Op Art? Opportunities for Artists is a monthly series of professional development workshops aimed at individual artists and small arts organizations. Coordinated by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, workshops can range from learning about the best ways to seek out grants to learning about insurance essentials for performing arts groups. Visit GCAC.org to learn more. Viewers often wonder what goes on behind the scenes of our Columbus Neighborhoods documentaries. Just how do we put all the jigsaw puzzle pieces together? Well, in response to viewers' requests, we've produced a segment that walks you through the process. From beginning idea to final frame, producer Cindy Gaylord and executive producer Brent Davis talk us through what it takes to research, film, and edit this popular series. I'm Brent Davis. And I'm Cindy Gaylord. We're part of the team that produces the Columbus Neighborhood Series. You can see some of us on the series opening. Well, there's you and there's me. Uh, we get asked a lot, who does the shows and how do the shows get made? We have five producers and two videographers on staff that work on the shows. It's lifeblood with steel and glass. Generally speaking, it takes about a year to complete one of these hour-long documentaries. And sometimes that surprises people because it takes so long, but there's a producer in charge of each episode, but we also kind of work in teams depending on the stories. We also get asked how we decide on the neighborhoods we cover. In the first phase of Columbus Neighborhoods, we covered six historic core neighborhoods. We knew downtown of Franklin would be a focus because of the bicentennial, and we worked our way out from there. To figure out the neighborhood boundaries, we look at historic maps, we see what neighborhood commissions and associations say, look at historical books, ask Columbus landmarks what they think, and talk to people in city governments. Uh, we have a historical advisor, Ed Lenz, who's been around forever. He'll tell us where he thinks a neighborhood begins and ends. Yeah, sometimes we fudge the boundaries if we think it's our only opportunity to, to get a particular story in. And then you have to figure out what to call the neighborhood. We called it South End. I've only ever heard South Side. I call it South End, but um, a lot of people call it South Side as well. South End. It was the end of Columbus. Columbus ended at the viaduct. That's where the streetcar ended. South End, that's right, see? I don't know, I always consider this kind of the east side. The, the story Figuring out what to call a neighborhood can be tougher end. than you think. You it south end. Once a producer knows the neighborhood they're responsible for, the research begins. We usually try to find out what's been written about our neighborhood. We make a lot of trips to libraries and bookstores and start reading. And we talk to lots of people as well. People tell us you ought to talk to so-and-so. We'll get names from newspaper articles and chase them down, mostly phone calls at first, and then follow up with meetings. Have you noticed that often the very first thing a producer does when they're assigned a neighborhood is visit every restaurant and tavern in the neighborhood? Restaurants are an important center of culture and commerce, Brent. Okay, give it a rest, Cindy. And from day one, we're looking for pictures, film, and video. I mean, it's TV. You've got to show something while you're talking about it. 
A lot of people tell wonderful stories, but we can't illustrate them, we don't have a show. And sometimes we leave out good stories because we don't have a way to illustrate them. Some of our best sources for images have come from the Columbus Metropolitan Library, from the Ohio Historical Society. They've been a great partner in all of those. Uh, WBNS has granted us access to their film archives, and that's been very helpful. And then we try to get to family albums, and that's really difficult. We don't know who has what until we sit down and talk to them and really go into the living room, sit down and look at what they have. For our recent Southside documentary, we found there was a thriving Facebook site already going, and people from that neighborhood were sharing images, and we used those. My dad grew up in Old Oaks. He was an old-time family doctor. And in fact, one of the stories we told about a neighborhood doctor who was much beloved came right from memories people posted on the Facebook page. I guess Facebook is more than words with friends after all. We've also done storytelling sessions in the neighborhoods where we've invited people to tell their stories. We videotape these for research purposes and then put them on the web. After we've done the research and combed the libraries and books and photo collections, we've compiled a list of people we think can help tell the neighborhood story on camera. These shows include between 20 to 60 interviews. Most interviews take a couple of hours by the time we've set up, put up the lights, and roll tape. You do know we don't use tape anymore, don't you, Brent? Yes. <laughs> we record on cards, just like the most higher-end consumer cameras. In fact, the cameras we use now look like those 35-millimeter cameras everyone used to use. When we go out, it often looks like we're just snapping some pictures instead of shooting video. They're DSLRs, digital single lens reflex cameras. They make gorgeous pictures. We work very hard to make these interviews look good. Our vids are very particular in doing everything they can to make every frame look beautiful. We might talk to an interview for an hour or two, but these shows are really pieced together one sentence or phrase at a time. We also have to shoot B-roll or cutaways that we use to illustrate these documentaries. And we spend a lot of time trying to, to get just the right shot. One tool we've used is the time-lapse shot. Uh, and one of our videographers built a device that moves the cameras, the camera incrementally over a long period of time for a, a special effect. It, it's actually housed in a little lunchbox. <laughs> yes. It looks like he's always hungry when he goes on a shoot. <laughs> yeah. Another new tool we're using is a remote control hovercraft for aerial shots. It uses a camera, an HD camera, that's about the size of a pack of cards. And it's placed in a radio-controlled aircraft that our videographers have learned to operate. We can even use this device indoors for moving shots. And this is a piece of equipment anyone can buy. In fact, a lot of hobbyists are shooting video with these hovercraft. They're pretty easy to fly. People from the north settled in Worthington. We've also used reenactments to tell these stories. We've shot at Ohio Village, Slate Run Farm, and we've used local reenactors, authentic costumes. These, these people in central Ohio, there's a whole community that um, love history and they love to reenact certain periods of history. And they create their own costumes that are absolutely perfect, right down to the buttons and the kind of thread that is used. We use horses, we use um, period musicians as well that have period instruments, which is really neat if you think about it, that there's a lot of people in central Ohio that love history so much, they're gonna find their instrument, sometimes make their own instrument, make their own costume, and um, just like performing. The edit booth is where the show really comes together. This is where the producer combines the snippets of all those interviews with the shots our videographers have captured. These shows take the better part of two months to edit, and I kind of have a rule of thumb. If I have a minute to maybe two minutes that I've edited in a day, I'm really happy. Uh, and a lot of people think that's uh, interesting that uh, you know it just takes so long to get this done. And the editing is where we add the narration. John Putnam, who's long been active in local theater, records the narration. I always tell him, once more with feeling, just because I can. And farther south on High Street, you could visit one of the nation's most famous farms, built from the profits of Dr. Samuel Hartman's elixir. He evidently had Music a is a big part of these documentaries. Each show might have nearly a hundred music cues, as they're called.
for. Most of these come from a library of music we purchased. This is music that is written specifically for use in media. Two of our shows, Short North and University District, we featured local musicians who graciously allowed us to highlight their work in the series. And then we gotta make everything fit into an hour. That's 56 minutes and 46 seconds to be precise. So that requires that we have to leave out some things we'd really like to include. The proverbial cutting room floor. Absolutely. And there's more to Columbus Neighborhoods than the broadcast. There's a companion website, columbusneighborhoods.org, where we encourage people to join the discussion and share their stories and memories and photographs. There's also a link to lesson plans for the series at the website. We're really pleased that the Ohio Humanities Council provided funding to develop lesson plans that helps teachers use Columbus neighborhoods in the classroom. We visited a high school social studies class at Fort Hayes and saw how it works. Students immediately are interested in, in anything that is a part of their daily lives. So one of the biggest themes, for example, in American history that we emphasize in high school, American history, is industrialization and immigration. And all of the documentaries have portions of them that deal with industrialization and immigration. We didn't speak English at home. If you, if you didn't speak Hungarian, you didn't eat. <laughs> Students love the narrative, and I think that's the great thing that the neighborhood's documentaries provide for them. They see history now as really relevant to them, um, that it's not just about people who lived many years ago in faraway places, but it's even about the people that they know who are who are part of living history in, in the community. The instructional part of Columbus Neighborhoods just won an award uh, given by public broadcasters and we're really pleased about that. One carriage that was a welcome sight was full of sausages. Well, I guess this wraps up our behind the scenes look at Columbus Neighborhoods. I hope seeing how Columbus Neighborhoods come together turned out better than seeing how Congress works. You know that story, it's like making sausage. You don't want to see the process. I think our making of process is not as disagreeable as the political process these days. But that reminds me, you did show some sausage making in the German Village program. Well, if it's an essential part of the neighborhood story, we're going to include it in Columbus Neighborhoods. The latest installment of our Emmy Award-winning series debuted last week on WOSU-TV, featuring Clintonville. Visit us online at columbusneighborhoods.org to view extra clips and bonus materials from all the communities that have been highlighted in the Columbus Neighborhood documentary series. One of the exciting things about Broad and High is we get to introduce you to some of the great artists around the country. And in return, PBS stations all across the U.S. will share our own Central Ohio segments to their communities, giving national exposure to our local talent. Set in lush, highly detailed natural settings, Choling Taha's vivid paintings integrate constellations of the night sky with native shapes to tell a universal story about humanity. A certified Cree First Nations artisan, Taha's work is inspired by her dreams as well as her desire to create a sense of mystery for the viewer. From our friends in St. Paul, Minnesota, comes this story. My artwork usually begins from a vision or a dream. So in a sense, it's like bringing a dream into reality. Sometimes they'll come in rapid succession. Sometimes it's quiet, and then sometimes you can't sleep all night. <laughs> in the sky, it sets the tone for the entire picture, so the sky is like the most important aspect of these paintings. I'm Choling Taha, I'm a native artist. I'm Cree First Nations. I was born in the bush country, just above New York. So where New York, Quebec, and Ontario come together, uh, that's the area I was born in. My husband and I had lived in Washington State for about 15 years. We had the opportunity to come to Minnesota, which was a dream come true for us. We'd talked about it for years, and uh, here we are. 
And skies are really delicate. They really have really, really soft colors, even though they look vivid. And that's one thing nice about Minnesota. It's got beautiful skies out here. I'm using native imagery to express an idea or a thought or a story. Now, some of them are actually indigenous stories and others are representing ideas through native imagery that are actually contemporary issues. This particular painting is called We Pull Together. It's based on the Northwest Coast story of the crab pot and how the crabs will all try to get out of the pot, but instead of helping each other get out, they pull each other back. It shows symbols from the Northwest Coast and the Great Lakes tribes. This is a Northwest Coast canoe, and the crabs, of course, are the, uh, Northwest Coast imagery. And the other crabs here are Ojibwe woodland style, and then, of course, the birch bark canoe, which is Ojibwe style canoe. And so the painting is talking about if we pull together as one human family, we can overcome even the crab pot metaphor. The shawl can represent many things. Uh, sometimes it's somebody's dream. Sometimes they went through an experience and they want that translated to a garment. Other people, they're being honored and they want a shawl for that. So they have lots of different ways they're being used. For shawl making, you have to begin with your concept just like a painting. The shawls start out as a drawing to uh, map out the design. And then once the drawing is uh, completed, I'll use uh, this plastic stencil material in order to do tracings, in order to cut out my pieces accurately. So this is the pattern that was used for the uh, birds here along the borders, these two border areas here. In the shawls, uh, I'm using the process of applique to create the patterns. So I'm layering uh, different fabrics of different colors on to essentially tell the story of that shawl and what it's trying to convey. I was commissioned to do a shawl over Facebook from a healer in Brazil. And her shawl was her dream, a dream of sea turtles and of the plant that she works with in the healing process. The biggest challenge with that shawl was really hoping that I was connecting to her correctly. Uh, when a person comes to you and has something that subtle and important to them, uh, you really want to make sure you're not putting your own input in it, that it's really coming across as their object. With the shawls, it's really important for it to be balanced. And I think with all the pictures, I want them to have a sense of balance. So when your person's looking at them, they can actually feel relaxed and enjoy exploring them. I really want people to take away a sense of mystery so that they look at their life beyond the TV, to really, really look at the trees and nature and water and sky and actually think about their own ancestors. Everyone has tribal ancestors, not just native people here in America. And we come from an incredible line of human knowledge. And I want people to be able to find that mystery in the pictures, regardless of their ethnicity. To mark the 150th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation, Westerville will host a series of documentary films throughout February to spark public conversations about the changing meanings of freedom and equality in America. Four films, with stories spanning from the 1830s to the 1960s, tell the remarkable stories of individuals who challenged the social and legal status quo of deeply rooted institutions, from slavery to segregation. Be sure to visit columbusarts.com for showtimes and locations. And while you're there, you're sure to find other events going on around town this week.
That's our show. To see more of today's stories and for extra bonus features from this episode, visit WOSU.org. We're also on Facebook and Twitter. We'll see you at the ultimate intersection of arts and culture next week on Broad and High. Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing and connecting the community to cultural events, artists, and classes at columbusarts.com. And by the Ohio Arts Council.